Hello everyone, no one of consequence here, back again with a new video. This is another installment in my DM Advice series, which I, where I offer suggestions for running classic Dungeons & Dragons adventure modules. In this episode, I will be talking about Dungeon Module G3, Hall of the Fire Giant King. So as always, spoiler alert, uh, this video is intended for Dungeon Masters only. If you ever intend to adventure through this module as a player, then watching this video will spoil the experience for you. So let's start with some background information regarding this module. It was first published by TSR in 1978. TSR was initially hesitant to publish adventure modules, thinking that there would be little interest in them. Their reasoning was, why would people buy adventure modules when they could just create their own scenarios? Judges Guild proved that there was a great deal of interest in published adventures. Uh, this uh, module was used as a tournament uh, adventure at Origin 78, um, so TSR did not have to create uh, this module from scratch when they decided to publish it they simply adapted already written material this adventure was republished as part of module G123 against the Giants in 1981 it was again published in the super module GDQ 1 through 7 Queen of the Spiders in 1986 It was reprinted in its original format and included in the 1999 D&D Silver Anniversary box set. Now if you're a collector and are looking for the old original printings which came out in the late 70s, then if you're looking for this module you might, uh, well you'll want to be careful because the Silver Anniversary reprint has the Silver Anniversary logo pointed out there in the bottom left hand corner so just make sure if you're looking for this on eBay or whatever make sure that you're getting an original printing and not one of these later reprintings. So this adventure uh, is also included in the 1999 module Against the Giants, The Liberation of Geov. Now, if you own any of these products uh, illustrated here, then you have the core information needed to run this adventure. They all contain the same basic details. There's no real difference. Uh, GDQ 1 through 7 does include a lot of new background information, which was intended to tie to tie together all the adventures in a more logical manner. I personally don't care for the uh, extra details found in this module. I prefer to just make my own. And then the uh, Against the Giants Liberation of Geoff includes, also includes new background information and it's updated for 2nd edition AD&D. But the good news is that uh, this adventure module is easily adaptable to any modern OSR rule system which you might be using. So all of this background information brings us to the module itself. First, this is the largest module in the Giant series. It contains three levels instead of the usual two. So if, you're, if you are considering running this adventure module, uh, you should pay attention to this paragraph. It says, the caution here though stresses experience. A party of three or four highly experienced characters of ninth or higher level can't expect a reasonable chance if they use their knowledge and cunning to best advantage. So when Kygax writes experienced here, he doesn't mean just the characters. The players themselves should also be very experienced. A new player, given a high level character to run, will probably not do well in this module. 
uh, goes on to say um, the writer still believes that a mixed group of clerics, fighters, magic users, thieves with a dwarf, elf, and a halfling or gnome or half elf will be most successful if they are at least ninth level and they're eight to ten. So, really, nothing new here. A, uh, as is usually the case, a well balanced mix of character classes will have the best chance of success. Uh, Guy Gax goes on to write, uh, This is a very difficult scenario, and the players might rue thoughtless actions, but do not allow this to temper what you have before you. But basically, what uh, first, Guy Gax has just given another warning that this is a, a, a difficult adventure. But he reminds the DM that uh, they should remain impartial and not try to weigh things in one direction or the other. So at the start, it says the party might have arrived before the huge obsidian valves which bar entrance to the hall by means of the transporter found in the lair of the frost giant Jarl. So yeah, if you're using this module as part of the G-Series campaign, the teleportation portal found at the end of G2 is going to be the easiest way for the characters to arrive here at G3. However, if you're running this module as a one-shot, you might want to devise a scenario for how the characters reach this remote and desolate location. Or you can just plop the characters down at the entrance like what we used to do back in the old days. So, but regardless of how the characters arrive here, they'll be able to find a hidden cave to use as a base of operations, just as in the previous modules. It says, uh, this hidden refuge will prove to be safe from detection as long as the party leaves no plain trail to it and as long as they are not followed to it. The difference this time, though, is that the characters uh, have a chance of being discovered in their hideout no matter how careful they are about covering their tracks. As the module says, if they thrice venture forth from the cave to raid the fire giant hall, there's a 10% cumulative chance per additional raid that the hidey hill will be found by the giants. So, 10% uh, chance on the fourth raid, 20% on the fifth, etc. So, obviously, this is meant to keep the characters from being too cautious in their forays to the fire giant lair. They uh, need to get it done as quickly as possible. So this is just a screenshot from my campaign showing the characters uh, when they arrive at the hideout cave entrance. And here they are stashing the extra supplies that they had brought along with them. The Gygax devotes a little space to describing the location for this adventure. As you can see here, uh, the sky is gray, filled with sooty clouds. A distant volcano can be seen. There's a glowing river of molten lava. It's hot and smells of heated rock and metal. So, as you can see, this environment isn't extreme as the glacial rift in the previous adventure, but it's still very unpleasant. At this early date in the game's history, there were no rules for running adventures set in extreme climates. So to help set the mood, you might want to prepare some visuals to display to your players. And uh, this is just one of the graphics that I used in my own campaign. Alright, so last warning, this is the last chance for potential players of this adventure to drop out of the video before real spoilers start being revealed. You have been warned. All right, to start with, uh, most adventure modules, including the one just before this, G2, place the final boss at the uh, very end of the adventure. However, module G3 flips this narrative and puts the fire giant king right up front. This is part of the upper level map and the arrow points out the entrance to the fire giant lair. And located just inside the entrance is a fire giant guard post. 
Furthermore, this guard has with him a large horn, which he can use to alert other giants to intruders. And just down that entrance passage in the Great Hall is King Snurry's throne room, pointed out here. So when the characters uh, arrive for the first time, King Snurry will be located in his throne room, along with many of his uh, personal guard. And here's a zoomed out view of the same area as depicted in my Roll20 campaign. You can see the entrance down in the lower left hand corner and then King Snurry sitting on his throne on the far right side. So as you can see, things can get very lively very quickly if the players are not cautious right from the start. Uh, Gaiax stresses that this should not be a static place with the inhabitants never moving from their starting locations. He writes, as soon as the party strikes and then retires, the attack will be assessed and countermeasures taken. He also says when the party retires from the hall, the fire giants will lay whatever traps and ambushes they are able to under the circumstances. Lights will be put out, sentries posted, and so forth. So as an example, um, here are a couple of screenshots from my Roll20 campaign which shows fire giants who are off-duty when the characters first arrive. But once the fire giants are alerted to the presence of intruders, these guards will certainly not continue to lounge about in their barracks. So the bottom line is the DM will need to continu continually rearrange the fire giant forces in response to the characters' actions. Just as in the previous modules of the series, this adventure is mostly about battling giants. In this case, fire giants, of course. These screenshots show a couple of locations where fire giants are on guard duty when the party arrives. And the characters are bound to encounter one of these locations eventually. Now, in addition to the fire giants, there are also a lot of hellhounds in this adventure module and as highlighted in the monster manual text on the left hellhounds have both a breath weapon attack and they also have a good chance of detecting invisible creatures so the fire giants will certainly make full use of these abilities uh, once they become aware of intruders and on the right hand side is a screenshot from my own campaign with the characters battling hellhounds um, although the, uh, as you can see on the monster manual entry, although the breath weapon attack doesn't do much damage, there are so many hellhounds throughout this adventure that it can, uh, quickly add up. And then if you require the players to make item saving throws versus the breath weapon attacks, then things can go even worse for them. But besides the hellhounds, there are, so there are several other special encounters that the DM will need to prepare for in advance. On level one, the characters can find a room with three Rakshasa. As highlighted in both the monster manual entry for this creature. Um, well, both the module text and the monster manual entry, uh, you can see they have the ability to appear to the characters as trusted friends. So this will hopefully allow the Rakshasa to attack the party by surprise whenever they think the time is right. So the DM should plan in advance who exactly these Rakshasa will appear as to their own players. And don't forget to come up with a plausible sounding cover story which uh, explains how these friends of the characters got here in the first place. Uh, the screenshot here on the left shows how the Rakshasa first appeared to my own players. They are all NPC friends of the characters from very early in this campaign. Then the screenshot on the right just shows the Rakshasa in their true form. So this is a, another encounter found on the first level 
uh, it's an evil dwarf who is an advisor to King Snurry. However, he will try to portray himself to the characters as a prisoner of the fire giants. It says the dwarf will claim that the giants have held him a prince, captive for ten years, trying to trick information out of him or to subvert his loyalty to dwarfdom when torture failed. So honestly, I think only very naive players would believe this dwarf's cover story. Yet the module is written for very experienced players. So you as a DM might want to flesh out the dwarf story to try and make it sound more believable. But you should also prepare for trouble to break out here very quickly, which is exactly what happened in my own campaign. So uh, down on the second level is a area which is a complex of prison cells holding various captives of the fire giants. One of them is this high-level thief, as described in the module text. It says that she's a human female, 11th level thief. It gives her stats and uh, says she'll gladly admit to being a thief caught trying to find King Snurry's treasure room. She'll volunteer to aid the party faithfully for a chance to escape. Alright, so... The Dungeon Master should prepare in advance a detailed backstory for this thief, including how she got to this remote location in the first place. As it is, she isn't even provided with a name in the module text. As you can see from her stats, she's very smart and charismatic, so you should try to portray her in that way same time her very low wisdom score would also explain why she was creeping around here by herself and then got captured. Another prisoner which the characters can find is this Titan. As explained in the module text he will join the characters as long as they are not evil themselves. It says he'll help a party destroy the inhabitants of this place. So obviously, uh, a Titan will make a very powerful addition to the party and will certainly help to ensure their success. The uh, thing to watch out for is just don't let the Titan become a crutch for the players. Uh, I had already planned in advance that he would stay with the characters only until King Snurry himself is defeated. Then after that, he would depart for his homeland regardless of how much of the fire giant lair remained to be explored and cleared out. Yet another location on the second level is this Temple of the Eye. Now this is an important location if you're running this adventure as part of the overall TGDQ campaign. And if you are doing that, then to flesh out the temple even more, I recommend you go to the Greyhawk Grognard website and download this uh, free supplement. There's information in there that will help you to get more mileage out of these temples, which are devoted to the Elder Elemental God. So also on the second level is a magically protected area housing the Hydro Priestess Eclavdra and two of her assistants. Uh, highlighted here in the text is uh, describes this wall of tentacles which prevents unauthorized persons from entering the Drow's living space. And here also is a screenshot of that encounter taken from my own campaign. So as you can see, it can be a uh, complicated encounter to run, and the DM should thoroughly study it ahead of time and prepare for playing it out. The encounter text goes on to describe the two drow curates, who are assistants to Eclavdra. Note that they both carry new unique magic items called tentacle rods. The DM should study these ahead of time and uh, be familiar with how they work so uh, they can be used to full advantage. 
Now this is also very likely the first time in this campaign that the characters uh, encounter true elves face to face. So don't forget to play that up as well. In the adjacent room is Eklavdra herself. As you can see from her stats and equipment, she is a very formidable opponent. She also wields a tentacle wand, but it's a more powerful version. Again, the DM should study this encounter well ahead of time if it uh, comes to combat between Eklavdra and the characters in here. Now you can see her 10th uh, level cleric fighter, you can see her stats, all of her uh, high level draw magic items, so... Anyway, just, uh, yeah, be prepared to run it. But uh, if the characters do get here, it's more likely that Eklavdra will choose to flee instead of fighting. Pointed out here, there is a secret escape route from the room, which uh, she can use if she needs to. So the DM should think in advance about her actions and if the characters, uh, if the character should make it into her private quarters. And if he clawed her, does flee, then the characters will probably encounter her again at the very end of the third level. Now, as previously mentioned, this module marks the first appearance of the Drill Elves before they were uh, codified in any rule book. The back of this module provides a detailed description of the Drill and all of their abilities. Shown here is just a uh, small sample of that section in the module. It's actually a couple of pages, I think. So uh, I personally created a cheat sheet which consolidates on one page all of the various draw weapons and abilities. This kept me from having to continually flip to the back of the module uh, or through pages in a rule book. This slide shows just a sample section of my cheat sheet, uh, but you as the dungeon master might find it useful to create something similar uh, for yourself before running this module. Most of the dro found in this module are located down on the third level. This map from the module points out where most of them can be found. You can see those numbered encounter areas. Those are where most of the dro are located. You can also see that there are multiple routes by which the characters might enter into the dro areas and begin interacting with them. However, I personally did not want the characters to find the dro too soon, and thus become distracted from the rest of this level. So what I did was I blocked off two of the access points, leaving only the one pointed out here. Now this might seem a bit railroady, and it's not something that I would normally do. However, I wanted to help ensure that the Dro encounters would be the final culmination of this adventure module. This may or may not be an important consideration for your own campaign, but it's something you might want to think about. And this screenshot uh, is from my own campaign, and you can see the blocked off passages and then the one remaining access point to the Dro area. Another encounter on the third level is a small chamber with a dozen fire beetles, as shown here. You can see uh, it gives their hit points and it says some will be on the ceiling and it'll drop down on the characters. Now, I honestly thought that this would be a quick encounter for the players, little more than a speed bump. However, as it turned out, the encounter ended up being much more challenging than I expected. This screenshot shows some of the characters being swarmed by the creatures. The elf Varus pointed out here had a fire beetle drop from the ceiling onto his head and he could not get it off no matter how he tried to roll to do so. Meanwhile other fire beetles were swarming around his feet and all of them were trying to bite him. 
party actually ended up retreating from this encounter. And in the final screenshot on the right, you can see that Varus still has that one fire beetle on his head. This just goes to show you that as a DM, you can never entirely predict how any particular encounter will play out. Elsewhere on the third level is this encounter with a Gorgon. You can read the details in the module text. Uh, you can see it first appears as the illusion of a red dragon, and uh, but it's actually a charmed Gorgon, and then it uh, gives information on uh, what conditions will cause the monster to react. But the uh, the most dangerous thing about a Gorgon is that their breath weapon can turn the victim into stone. And in this screenshot from my own campaign, uh, you can see the encounter playing out. The uh, dwarf character, pointed out here, has already been turned to stone by the monster. And then again, Varus, the elf, uh, he was targeted next, but uh, luckily he made his saving throw. Now, if you're running this adventure module uh, as part of the overall campaign in sequence, at no point will the characters ever find any magic item specifically made for reversing a character who has been turned to stone, which presents an obvious problem if that does happen. And even the magic user spell Stone to Flesh is a 6 level spell. Characters cannot cast 6 level spells until they reach 12th level of experience which is probably higher than any of the characters adventuring through this module. The only magic item which might be of use is a Ring of Three Wishes, which the players can potentially acquire in Module G2. If the characters do find it and still have it, by the time they encounter the Gorgon, it could be used to revert a character who has been turned to stone. Another possibility is the Titan, which the characters might have rescued earlier in this adventure. As pointed out here, Titans do have high-level spellcasting ability. It says all, all Titans are able to employ both magic user and clerical spells of 4th, 5th, 6th, and even 7th level. And then it goes on to describe how to determine what any individual Titan can do. The problem is the particular titan found in this adventure module has only clerical spell casting ability. It says he is able to employ spells of up to 6 level clerical. And as I just mentioned, stone to flesh is a magic user spell, not clerical. So the DM would have to adjust the abilities for this titan if it is to be a potential help to the party. Otherwise, a character who is turned to stone by the Gorgon might spend the rest of the adventure in that state. Moving on, there is also an ancient red dragon located on the third level of this adventure module. You can see I've highlighted him there, an ancient male, very large dragon with 88 hit points. And then it gives more details about him. Uh, just as I mentioned in my video reviewing Module G2, G3 was also written for first edition AD&D. However, dragons as found in the first edition Monster Manual are really not that tough, especially for a group of characters that are of adequate level to adventure in this module. Therefore, I recommend using the stats and abilities for dragons as found in the second edition Monsters Compendium. Or you can use whatever stats appear for dragons in the OSR rule system of your choice, just as long as those dragons are more powerful than what is found in the first edition Monster Manual. Here's a screenshot of the characters in my campaign encountering this ancient red dragon. As you can see, the, uh, the party halfling Gorbanok did not have a good day on that day. Now, later on in the third level, the characters can encounter a high-level Dro Priestess and her personal bodyguard. 
who will not necessarily be hostile to them. This encounter can be extremely important to an adventuring party which is playing through the entire TGDQ campaign. If approached diplomatically, the characters can actually learn a great deal from this priestess about what is going on regarding Eclavtra and the Elder Elemental God faction of Drow Elves. As you can see there uh, in the highlighted module text, uh, her name is Ned Eileen. She's a Drow Noble. And she is opposed, uh, as a worshipper of Loth, she's opposed to anything he clawed or attempts. So she's here to check up on her rival. And um, says she'll be suspicious of anyone who finds her here. But on the other hand, she will not be adverse to seeing her rival's plans go wrong. So the DM will likely want to try to facilitate this encounter to be a peaceful one, as illustrated here in my personal Roll20 campaign. Towards the end of this adventure module, the characters must pass through a chamber currently occupied by three Mind Flayers. As described in the adventure module text, the Mind Flayers are here to gather information and are not necessarily looking for a fight. You can see uh, it gives their hit points. It says they've decided to see what's going on with their friendly enemies, the Drow. They plan to observe events and the Dark Elves ignore them. Now, the, this detail about what the Mind Flayers are here for, uh, the characters might be able to take advantage of that, although they won't necessarily know it at first. One option is that in exchange for being told everything the characters have learned about the Drew, the Mind Flayers might simply depart peacefully, and they might even uh, give the characters a reward, as described in the module text. But regardless, this encounter should be a challenge for the characters to navigate, whether through combat or through diplomacy. Now, if it does come to combat and your campaign uses psionics, then uh, you know, you're just going to have to play out the battle with the Mind Flayers as you see fit. However, if you do not use psionics, like me, then you should prepare for this encounter ahead of time by using these tables found on page 78 of the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. In short, the Mind Flayers will not hesitate to use their psionic-like abilities against any aggressor. Again, this encounter should be a challenge for the characters to get past, no matter how they decide to approach it. Alright, so to sum up this adventure module. The entire module has only 15 pages of text, and just like the other modules in this series, it's densely packed. There's a lot of information provided for only 15 pages. The volcanic setting is an interesting change from the usual temperate adventure locations. As I said earlier, the environment here is not as dangerous as the Arctic-like conditions found in Module G2, but it can still be challenging. This is not a beginner's module, and that includes a dungeon master. So as with the other modules in this series, the players should be very experienced, and the Dungeon Master has a lot to keep track of, and uh, should be well prepared before trying to run this adventure. This is the first time in the TGDQ campaign storyline where the characters encounter the Drow. Keep in mind, when this adventure module was first published, the Drow Elves were a new and unknown race. It's going to be difficult to replicate that sense of mystery now, but you know, try to do the best you can. This module is extremely challenging and it requires a lot of DM prep to properly run it, which is you know what I've been showing you this entire video. Uh, the Dungeon Master's got a lot of prep work to do if this adventure is going to be run to its full potential. This module provides a good balance of combat, stealth, and diplomacy, so no matter what style of gameplay your players enjoy, it can be found somewhere in this adventure module. 
It is a must play as part of the TGDQ campaign. You definitely don't want to skip it. But it's also highly recommended as just a one-shot adventure. So even if you're not running the entire campaign, this module is equally worthy as a one-shot for high-level characters running, uh, being run by experienced players. So in summary, I'm confident in saying that no one will be disappointed by playing through this, through this adventure module if it has been properly prepared ahead of time. All right, well, that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Please leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Uh, don't forget to share the video if you can. Anything you can do to help support the channel, I appreciate it. Thanks again. Bye for now. The greatest adventure is what I